Dr. Adrian Dorrington, National Education Association Senior Policy Analyst in the Teacher Quality Department, is a former high school science and math teacher and science department head. She also taught in higher education, preparing prospective classroom teachers. In her current position, she is primarily responsible for overseeing federal and state policies related to teacher evaluation. She provides technical support to state and local affiliates as they reform their teacher evaluation systems. And she works with programs that prepare teacher leaders. If that's not enough, Dr. Dorton, Dorrington excuse me, has been intricately involved in helping to advance NEA's work on institutional racism and racial justice in education. This current body of work is an extension of her passion in lifelong work in social justice education, anti-racist education, culturally responsive teaching, and critical pedagogy. Dr. Dorrington's work in these areas continue to be driven by her belief that every child deserves a competent, caring, and culturally responsive educator. It's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Dorrington, my colleague and friend who will lead tonight's content. Wow, Anthony, I'm going to put you in charge of my uh, fan club. Thank you so very much. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Jessica, to my colleagues from the ESTQ department. But most importantly, I really want to thank all of you who have signed on tonight for a webinar. There are many other things you could be doing on a Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, Eastern time, that is. There are many other things you could be doing. But to sign on to this webinar reflects your passion and your commitment to this topic. And I actually, as Anthony said, I, this particular topic is actually in the core, my DNA core, something I've been really engaged with for more decades than I choose to count. However, we're living in a particular time in our society where this topic has now become crucial and we need to address it head on. So tonight, uh, over the course of the next 55 minutes, we're not going to walk away with all the solutions. I wish I could say that I could do that, but hopefully we'll walk away with some learnings. What I hope to achieve tonight is that you'll have a better understanding, that there'll be a shared understanding of racial justice. Because one of our problems tend to be is that we tend to use the same words, but with different meanings. The other thing is to analyze the complexity of racial injustice. It's not as simple as someone being denied, one individual being denied their rights. It's not as simple as one individual being excluded. It's not as simple as one individual not being able to get a job or uh, find a, affordable housing. It's much more complex than that. And no pun intended, it is not a black or white thing. So it's not a yes or a no or either or or. So we want to talk a little bit about the complexities. And in addition to that, we would like to have the opportunity to explore strategies and how do you engage in dialogue with your colleagues and communities that will advance racial justice. How do you have these courageous conversations? What do you say and how do you engage your colleagues? And, and more importantly, how do you start to look at yourself as a, a person engaged in these conversations? In terms of uh, this evening, I'm going to uh, present with you a few uh, what I call community norms. And basically, anytime we talk about race, it's not an easy subject. And I want to set up these norms, and also it becomes challenging when we have uh, such things as webinars. I'm going to ask you to stay engaged with this topic. I know it's very, very easy to multitask. I know it's easy to have the TV on and looking at the TV or reading closed captions or doing other things. I know that. But please stay engaged with this, uh, with this topic. Don't check out. Also, share your truth. Share what's in your heart, because a lot of this a lot of this is a journey. Think of it as a journey that begins with you. This is not an easy topic. If it was easy, it would have been resolved centuries ago. It is not an easy topic. And you, you may experience discomfort as we start to engage in some of the conversation. But that's, that's normal. So it's all right to engage in the, to in, uh, feel this discomfort and connect with those feelings. Try to understand, like, why are you feeling that way? Expect and accept non-disclosure. As I said before, we are not going to uh, we're not going to resolve everything tonight. And agree to disagree. Several others maintain confidentiality. What is said here will stay here. So I would like you to walk away saying that this is what we talked about, but not that Adrian said this or Anthony said that and Jessica said this. 
I'm going to ask everyone to uh, participate as much as possible. We have the chat box there, so feel free to enter your comments and your questions in the chat box. And honor, we're going to, as best as possible, honor your time. And also, you can use the chat box to sometimes include non-related topics that we may not get to tonight, but may have an opportunity to address at a later date. So with that being said and done, let's begin the session for this evening. When we talk about NEA, it's an association that has a very long, rich history, starting way back in the late 1800s. So we've been around for 155, 160 years. When we started, NEA was rooted in social justice. If you look at our rich history, you will find that we were engaged in the the voting rights for women, the suffrage movement. We were engaged in the civil rights movement. We were engaged in the union movement. NEA has been engaged in a lot of social justice activities since its inception. The social justice principles are embedded in who we are and what we do. So it's, again, it's in the NEA DNA. It's who we are and what we do. When you read our vision statement, it's a social justice statement. It's grounded. It's rooted in social justice. And what is it? It says it's a great public school for every student. And as you know, Lily, our president, often says, irregardless of zip code. So it's a great public school for every student. Our mission statement? Our mission statement advocates for educational professionals and to unite our members and the nation to build the promise of public education. And public education is supposed to be one of our most democratic institutions to allow and provide opportunities for every child to be successful. So our vision statement and our mission statement, they're grounded in social justice uh, tenets. Then we have a set of core values which were developed uh, approximately uh, 10 years ago. And our core values, there are six of our core values. One is equal opportunity. Well, we know what that means. It means that we believe that public education is a gateway to opportunities and that every student has the human and civil rights to a quality public school that develops their potential, that develops their independence, and that develops their character and equal opportunity. We also believe that we in a just society. That means it's vital to building respect for the worth, dignity, and equality of every individual in our diverse society, that there is a justice. Then our next core value is democracy. We believe that education is one of the, is a major cornerstone or a foundation of our republic. When you start to indicate, or when you start to reflect on the history of the United States, education was foundational in bringing us together as a society and weaving us together with common values, a common understanding, common passions, and so on. Public education provides individuals with the skills to be involved in civic duties. It enables them to be informed and engages them as representatives in our democracy. Another core value that's grounded in social justice is professionalism. We believe in the expertise and judgment of educational professionals. They're crucial to the success of every student. We believe that to, we maintain the highest standards, irregardless of what area of uh, education you may occupy, we maintain the highest standards and we expect status and compensation and respect for all of our professionals, all of our professionals who are engaged in the educational system. We also believe in the partnership with families and parents and communities, faith-based organizations, and other stakeholders that you can, uh, can consider or reflect upon. All of those partners, remember, we cannot educate a child by ourselves. This is a collective activity. It takes a village to raise a child, and that's the partnership that we're referring to. And the collective action. We believe individuals are strengthened when they work together. There's a degree of synergy there. There's a degree of energy there that comes from groups working together for the common good, with a shared vision, with a shared understanding, with a shared goal. As education professionals, we improve our professional status and the quality of public education when we all work together for the success of every child. But the question comes, and I've heard this time and time again, the question comes, but why racial justice in education? Why racial justice in education? 
Well, before we get into that, I want to um, have a polling question. I want to put up a question here to try to find out what's your understanding of race? Because before we can start talking about racial justice, we have to know what do we mean when we talk about race? And over there to the right, you will see the polling question. And so I'm going to ask you to select which statement is true. Statement number one, the concept of race is based on science. Is it the concept, race is a concept developed by society? There exists very few races. Race is biologically determined. And again, I'll just give you maybe another minute or so. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back and look at this question, which is the following is true. For those of you who selected two, Race is a concept developed by society. You are indeed correct. You are indeed correct. But let's look at the other statements there, because a lot of people harbor, a lot of people believe that race is based upon science. Well, I'm going to get to that in a few moments. It may be based upon science, but I would qualify that science as junk science, not the type of science that you and I would think of as terms of traditional science. There exists, and I notice in uh, statement number three, there exists very few pure races. There, are no, there is no such thing as a pure race. And race is biologically determined, once again, totally false. There is no biological underpinning for race. If you look at a person's DNA, if you look at a person's red blood cell, by looking at the red blood cell, by looking at the DNA, or by looking at muscle tissue, you cannot tell whether or not that particular muscle tissue, just looking at the muscle cells, if it came from an African American, if it came from an African, if it came from an Asian, a Chinese, or Vietnamese, if it came from a Pacific Islander, if it came from a white person living in Ireland, or a white Asian coming from Germany, that cannot be determined. Race has been developed by society. So we're going to get more into this. So I mentioned before, some people, and we'll hit end poll here. Okay, thank you. Racial construct, real or not real? I mentioned before, there are some people that will say that race, the concept of race, is based upon science. There was a time in our history whereby back in the 1800s, they thought that you can determine race by looking at the head size. You know, the bigger the cranium, the bigger the skull, the more brains you had. That was, that's how they equated it. So big head people, I would imagine, based upon their thinking, were very intelligent. And they would actually measure the diameter of your head. And more often than not, it was found that black people had very narrow heads and white people had very, had much larger heads. Therefore, white people must be smarter than black people. Because again, they're measuring this, they're measuring this, again, the diameter of the skull. There was also a time when they had what we, and um, Hitler had also bought into this one, the eugenic movement, that the white race, which they call the pure race, they were highly intellectual. And so they would start to breed this in the eugenic movement. And by the way, that eugenic movement, when you start to think of the KKK and a lot of these hate groups, there's an underpinning, they may not call it the eugenic movement, but there's an underpinning of races, one race being superior than the other. And again, they try to back that up with what I would call, quote unquote, junk science. So again, why racial justice in education? I'll go back to the original question. When you look at this, I'll take a few moments to read this for those who may be able to see it. It says, when I think that all lives matter, we should care equally. We should, we should care exactly equally at all times about everything. All houses matter. Now look at that for a moment. 
Look at that for a moment. Notice the cartoon. Yes, all houses matter, but there's one house that's currently on fire. And right now we have a society where there's one race that really is on fire. We're in a critical moment. I don't need to tell you about the news. About a week and a half ago, there was a young 15-year-old, Jordan Edwards, at a party with his two brothers and another person down in, I want to say, Austin, Texas. I can't recall the city of the top of my head, but I do recall it was Texas. Underage drinking, a call went into the police department, underage drinking. And so when the kids heard that the police were on the way, they scattered. Jordan's brother jumped in the car. Jordan jumped in the car as well with his other brother, and they sped off. They, they drove off away from the police officer. Yes, you know the story. Jordan Edwards was shot in the forehead. He was shot, and also you know the, the history behind that. I don't need to talk to about Jordan Edwards. We have uh, Trayvon Martin. We have Tamara Rice, and we can go on and on and on. We have a situation whereby many parents of African-American youth, and especially males, they become terrified the moment that their, their young uh, sons leave the home at night because they don't know if their son's going to be safe and if their son's going to return all right. So, yes, all lives matter, but we need to be very real about why we need to focus on race. We need to make this conversation of race front and center. And so with the focus on race, it forces you to talk about race. Yes, you can talk about the intersectionality, but you must put the conversation of race front and center because the entire society, this society has been built on a caste system. This society has been built on a, a, a racial type of society whereby one group of people helped to build while another group of people helped to, uh, were able to enjoy the wealth. So as I said before, we look at race, we got racial profiling going on. We have environment and racism. We have transit racism. We have racial redlining. We have housing discrimination. And so as we look at this, we're going to uh, look at a video. The video is approximately four minutes and some seconds there. I'm going to say four minutes and ten seconds. And I want you to look at that video. And after you uh, look at that video, at the very end of that video, I would like you to uh, type in the chat box one or two words or phrases that come to your mind at the conclusion of that video. All right? So we're going to look at the video now. <laughs>
Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Okay, I asked you, and I, it's very important that when I go through this, uh, the webinar tonight, it's very important the language that I use and how the language is being interpreted. And so when I talk about things as being uh, black or white, or, you know, either or, I want you to realize I'm not talking about black as in African American or black people, or white as in white or Caucasians. I'm talking about black or white being like an either or situation, a pink or a blue situation. I'm talking about a binary situation. Uh, I'm talking about a binary system, one or the other, a yes or a no. So uh, I want to make sure that the language I use is very, very clear and it's not clouded and it doesn't get in the way of the discussion. I did ask you, after you, you finished looking at that, write a word or two in the chat box. I want to thank you very much for some of these uh, words I see here. While I like the video, I'm not sure it would speak to low income. Yes, it, it, and I, I'll get to the low income white man in just a few moments. I, I will get to that because there is another form of injustice. But again, we have to look at be part of this whole uh, notion around the uh, racial injustice is that when we start to look at issues of economic injustice, and which impacts everyone. Also, as you saw through that, there's so many obstacles. Again, we tend to think that this whole issue around uh, racial inequality or racial justice, that it's a matter of uh, just making sure they get good teachers. It's much more than that. There are so many obstacles that are built in the system that impacts many of our students, that impacts many of our minority students. This is a very good video, and I would say I would highly recommend that you take an opportunity to sit down and look at that video and try to think of how would, you do, how would you describe that video? How would you engage in some of that dialogue with some of your colleagues? How would you begin that? But before you begin the engagement of a dialogue with a colleague, how do you feel about that video? What does that video say to you? So. As I said before, what we're trying to do here is put the conversation of race in the center, recognizing that there's going to be intersections. When we talk about racial justice, we're talking about the systematic fair treatment of people of all races. The, opti the optimal word here is all races that result in equitable opportunities and outcomes for everyone. Another word I want to highlight here is equitable, not equal, it's equitable. Let's say, for example, um, someone I know, let's say uh, John. John has uh, diabetes, really bad case of diabetes. And Mary has, um, let's say, high blood pressure. Do we give the same medication to both? One is diabetic and one has high blood pressure. Do we give the same medication to both? Or let's say, for example, one has severe diabetes and one is just a mild case of diabetes and that, can be, uh, that can be controlled through diet, do we write the same prescription? No, we have to look at the condition, and based upon that condition, how do we treat that? So that's what we mean when we talk about equitable opportunities for everyone. You have to look at the situation. Now, there are four different forms of racial injustice that we want to, I just want to highlight tonight. One's internalized. By internalized, we have a lot of our students who, who feel very, very much marginalized. They're told that they can't succeed. They're told either directly or indirectly, we don't expect much of you. You come from broken families. You come from single families. You come from low-income families. You come from this part of town. You come from this country. You don't speak this language. There are many different forms, and by our actions sometimes and by our words and other deeds, these kids become victimized, and they start to self-victimize. They see themselves as victims, and as a result, they start to develop this sense of helpless, helplessness and hopelessness. I can't do this. And so there was a time, and I'm sure there is a time still, we had a rash of young students, and I know on some Native American uh, reservations, young students committing suicide because, again, they feel so oppressed. Then there's your interpersonal. The interpersonal injustice, that's more that will make the CNN news or the MSNBC news or whatever. This is when there's the interaction. There is some action between, two, uh, between people from different uh, races. This tends to make the news because this tends to be, quote, unquote, sexy. It grabs people's attention. Then on the other side, on the right-hand side there, 
we have um, we have what we call institutional racism. Inside each institution, there is a framework. There's a framework of how that system was developed, how that institution was developed, and how that institution operates. More often than not, if you look at the historical uh, historical records of that institution, you will find that there was a very small group of people that put that framework together, that put those operations in together. And you start to look at how that system favors one group of people and marginalizes another group of people. Where one group is favored and another group is marginalized. All you have to do is look at the banking in industry. There was an article read not so often long ago that car insurance, a lot of times car insurance is based upon your credit rating. Your car insurance based upon your credit rating. Whether or not you have a mortgage, whether or not you pay your bills on time, how one part of the system, financial system, will impact another part of the financial system. And therefore, your insurance rates are based upon your credit rating, not your driving ability, not your driving success, but rather your credit. And then structural, and structural, that one where we talk about not just the the uh, health system or the justice system or the educational system, we're talking about this now collectively. So we need to know that there are many different forms of racial injustice. Ones that will hit you between the eyes and other ones that are very, very covert, ones that are hidden that you cannot see. Important distinctions to make, there is what diversity is not the same as equity. And when we talk about diversity, we think just because we have a lot of diverse people being represented in the room, a lot of different cultures are in the room, a lot of different races are in the room, therefore, they must have voice. Therefore, they must be having some type of input or influence. Not necessarily. We can have a whole lot of diverse people who are still marginalized. We can have a whole lot of diverse people who still have no power. We can have a whole lot of diverse cultures who still will have no say in how the system runs. And when we look at our country, we see that more and more of our country is being run by a one percenters, where by the 98 percent or the 99 percent have very little say in terms of how the system is actually going to run. So diversity does not equal equity. And equity and equality are different. As I said before, equality is when you give everyone the exact same thing. Equity is about fairness. You give them what they need so they can be successful. Here's a situation whereby you're able to see the difference between equity and equality. Look at the three little guys on the left. These are three guys looking over, trying to look over a fence. See the little green fellow, the little orange fellow, and the little gray fellow. That's equal. They all have been given the same size risers or boxes to stand on. And even though they're all given the same size boxes to stand on, the little guy in the green, he can see over the fence really easy. The guy in orange, he can see over the fence. The little guy in gray cannot. But if we look at this from an equity lens, what does each one of them need so that they will have a good view over the fence? Well, the green guy really doesn't need a box to look over the fence. The guy in uh, the little orange fella, he may need a riser, but the little guy in gray, he needs a couple of risers so he can look over the fence. So we have to look in terms of equality versus equity. Here, I'm not going to t spend any time on this uh, tonight because I'm very uh, cognizant of time. But again, what I would have done here, and this is something that you can talk about among in your, uh, in your school setting, in your educational setting, when we start looking at equality and equity. If you're at a school A, that's the little guy over there who can very easily see over the fence. What do you see in school A that you may not see in school B? And what would you see in school B that you may not see in school C? This is a very good question. This is a very good activity for people to start to realize. In some of these schools, you know, there are schools with swimming pools. There are schools with theaters. There are schools with bands. And there are schools whereby they have none of that. There are schools with school nurses. There are other schools that share nurses. And there are some schools with no nurses. So this is a good activity whereby you can sit down with your colleagues and start to look at, let's look at equality and equity. And what would these different schools look like? Action planning. What can we do? Well, we can start to acknowledge that racial justice, uh, racial injustice does exist. There's a lot of people that will still deny this. We will have people that will say, if they pulled up their bootstraps, if they pulled up their bootstraps and do what they're supposed to do, they would have an opportunity to be successful. It's on them. 
Their parents are their parents are not interested in their children going in education. They never come to PTA, not realizing that the parents are working three jobs and have to work three jobs, or there's no transit there that will get them uh, from their, where they live to the school system because the bus doesn't run down there, or the metro stops running at a certain time, or the buses on that road stops running at a certain time. We need to recognize that this country, that there is racial injustice in this country. We need to also uh, investigate our own actions and behaviors. If we actually believe in equity, what do you do? Would I be able to tell, if I were to uh, shadow you all day, would I be able to tell by your words and your deeds that you believe in an equitable society? Can I see that? Would I hear that? And what would that look like? And then take steps to minimize negative impact. We have kids who are being victimized day in and day out by the images on TV, by what they read in the paper and the social media, by what happens in the classrooms, by what happens on the way to school, by what happens on the way back from school. How can we start to help to minimize the negative impact? Imagine, again, if you were a parent of a young African-American male, and research bears this out. There's a lot of people that fear the African-American male. Imagine if you're a parent, and here you raise this little baby, and all of a sudden this baby becomes 13 years old and this baby's now 15 years old, and people are afraid of your baby. People are afraid of your child. People are afraid of your son. And that son and our students, they know when we fear them. Our students know this. And as a result, here's a person that has to live knowing that people are fearful of them. How do we help that child feel included? How do we help that child feel accepted? What are you doing in your classroom? Because there's only so much that you as an individual can do. Well, as I said, this whole journey starts with you. We can't point the finger at other people first. We have to look at ourselves, stand in front of the mirror. What do I believe about racial justice? How am I complicit? Am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution? What do I do to advance it? So question your first impressions. Be able to justify your decisions and ask for constructive feedback. We had a conversation, I had a conversation earlier today with some of my colleagues, and we talked about it's easy to give advice. It's easy to give recommendations and suggestions to other people. Here's what you should do. Here's what you should say. Here's where you need to go. But it's very, very difficult sometimes to receive uh, constructive feedback. Adrian, I don't think you said that the appropriate way. Adrian, you know, a lot of people were hurt by the way you said that or the way what you did there caused some pain for some people or some people felt marginalized or victimized by something that you did. Sometimes it's hard to hear that because the very first thing I want to do is say, no, I didn't do that. I want to defend my actions rather than listening to what is being said and then start to reflect upon what did I say and what did I do. I know what I intended to say. I know what I intended to do. However, the person on the other side, it came across differently. I have to go back and look at my behavior. Creating alternative uh, narratives. In this situation, uh, on the left-hand side here, you may have seen this movie called The Path. And this is a movie about three young African-American males from Newark, New Jersey. And these three young guys met up in high school. One is Raymond Hunt. And Raymond Hunt grew up to become a doctor eventually. But his mom was a drug addict. All three boys, by the way, let me start off with, all three boys grew up in public housing. So therefore, low income. All three young guys had single moms. And when we look at Remick Hunt, it just so happens his mom was a drug addict. His grandmother raised him. He had a lot of anger issues, and I would put that in quote because it, de it de depends on who is defining anger issues. They claim that he needed anger management. But again, it depends on who defines that. But nevertheless, he was in trouble a lot, in and out of school a lot, and by the time he hit high school, he ran across two other young African-American males, one being Samson Davis, and Samson Davis was the fifth of five children, again, living in a public housing, and he claimed that education saved his life. He loved education. And one of his friends was George Jenkins, who, at, uh, when he was, uh, I think, 15 years old, he went to visit a dental clinic, and he became so inspired that he had indicated then, at the age of 15 and 16, he wanted to become a dentist. Now, in research, 
And in the everyday society, these three young African-American males should never have been successful. They would have been part of the so-called gangs. They would have been incarcerated. They would have been criminals. They would have been drug addicts. They would have been rappers. They would have been all these other things. But no one would have looked at these three young African-American males coming from public, public housing in New York, New Jersey as potential doctors. Two of them are medical doctors and one is a dentist. The other on the right-hand side of the screen, which just tickles my spine, here you see a group of young African-American grade 12 students visiting President Obama in the White House. Again, how often do we see that image? This is not the image you see on CNN. This is not the image you see on Fox News. This is not the image you see on MSNBC. We tend to see images of very negative images, people being handcuffed, pinned to the ground, a mugshot. That's the image that's flashed across social media. That's the image that's flashed in the newspapers and across the television screen. That's the image that many of these kids have seen of themselves. Not the positive image that we see on the left, but the image that we see on the right. And even again, when we start to think of those characteristics or those variables, President Obama should never have graduated from high school. A single mom, his mother was white. As you know, his father was African. He was, his father left, was not part of his life, really. His mom raised him. He lived for a short period of time over in the Philippines area. However, here's a kid that biracial, and that's another whole set of challenges. Here's a kid biracial, father of the picture, trying to find out and decide who he is and what he was all about, trying to find an identity, shape his identity, try to find out where he belonged. Who would have thought when you saw this kid at 12 who was the potential president of the United States? and leader of the free world? Who would have thought at 18 a potential president and leader of the free world? No, what happens is that our, our biases, sometimes our, our, our biases, our, our assumptions about different groups of people based upon what we read in the media or what we think or what someone told us, shape and put ceilings and put, uh, and put these folks in boxes. So we need to think about how do we counter these narratives? How do we counter these negative stereotypes? Some of them may be assumptions or implicit bias that you have yourself, but how do you counter them in the school system? And you know there's a lot in the school system. The association, we need to be cognizant of how we associate things. When we think about immigrants, when we think about immigrants, there's a, there's a group of people within the United States. When they think about immigrants coming in here or undocumented immigrants or refugees, they associate them, they have very negative associations. These are people coming in here taking our jobs. These are people coming in here taking our land. These are people coming in here forcing us to change. These are people coming in here refusing to speak English. These are people coming in here taking, 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 and taking, taking, taking from us. There's that segment of society. But again, if you were to look at that image at the bottom, look at the image at the bottom. These American citizens who are doctors and lawyers and engineers, and teachers, and uh, chiropractors, and sales clerks, and in every occupation, and every profession you can think of, these are people who have come in here, and they bring their skills, they bring their rich experience, they bring everything they can to share with this nation, to make this nation even richer. So when we think of people coming in, we need to change how we see these people. Rather than seeing them coming in here with nothing to offer and only taking, see them coming in here with skills. They have some, they have lived experiences that we can never and may never be able to understand. But their experiences will add richness to who we are and see them coming in here with this rich tapestry of experiences to add. You need also to hold others accountable. When we talk about hold others accountable, create a culture of calling out biases. When people start to, when we look at the school discipline policy, why is that particular student being expelled? When two students, one from one race and one from the other, did the exact same infraction, but one student gets maybe time out or knuckles wrap, and the other student goes for several days. We need to call out the implicit bias, how kids are put in classes, where they're put, and all the other things that happen in the school system, and even ourselves as professionals. How is that system structured to allow us to do the best that we can for our students 
and to provide us with the type of support and resources for us to be highly effective in our particular positions. So not only do we call out a culture that has implicit bias, we ask others to justify their decision, and we also involve diverse stakeholders in collective decision making. All the decisions can't be made by one person or two people or just the uh, just the uh, the principal and the vice principal or just the superintendent. We need to make sure that we have diverse groups of people. Bring in a, a diverse bring in your parents. Or if they don't want to come into the school, let's go to the community center and meet with a group of diverse parents. What do they have to say? They have opinions. They all have opinions. What do they have to say? And encourage them to share. See them as partners in this. Remember, they have a vested interest in the success of their children, like we do. And they also were the very first teachers. We just happen to be the second group of educators working with their students. But the long and short of it, we need to make sure that all voices are being heard. All voices are being heard as we make decisions that will impact everyone. So as we come to a close tonight, I want you to consider all that I said. First of all, I have talked about the importance of having a shared understanding, having a shared understanding of what we meant by racial justice. I also asked us to look at the complexities of race. This is not just looking at one particular group of people and forgetting all those other variables that impact, and also look at strategies, how we can start to engage in dialogue with First of all, this particular journey begins with ourselves. We can't talk about racial justice in education until we look at how do we perceive racial justice. What does it mean for Adrian? What are my assumptions? What are my biases? Once I kind of deal with me, once I reflect on me, then I can start having a conversation, a courageous conversation with my colleagues. I don't need to tell you. Not everyone's going to be buying into this. Not everyone's going to be running into your educational setting wherever you are tomorrow wanting to know more about this. There will be a couple people that will, uh, that will want to hear and a couple people will want to engage in the conversation. But how do we start with that critical mass and keep building and building and building? Keep in mind, Rome was never, Rome was never built in a day. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. And as I said, I just love this topic. And you guys are on the front line. There is so much that you can do. And we really, we're really vested in you being successful. Because if you're successful, the students are successful, and our nation is successful. So you have a major role to play. So again, I'm going to open it up to questions. So thank you very much. And the other, there's one other comment I want to make, too. Uh, even though the conversation tonight was about race and putting race front and center, we also need to recognize that there's, and the other, there's one other comment I want to make, too. Uh, even though the conversation tonight was about race and putting race front and center, we also need to recognize that there's intersectionality. And that's not to say that, uh, it comes race, but we need to understand that there are other variables that come into play. When we there was a, a question or comment made there earlier about poor white male, the poverty issue. There's an intersection between race and poverty. We know that we have transgender issues. We have uh, transgender situations. There's many many different areas where there's an intersection. We know we have sexism. We have ageism. We have a, a series of different isms. And a lot of those isms, there's an intersectionality. You, meet, you need to recognize and acknowledge the importance of race, but you also need to recognize the intersection of how race intersects with all these other forms of social injustice. Remember, racial injustice is only a component of social injustice. So, Adrian, there was another question that came up that um, there's great conversation about it in the chat box, but I also wanted to ask you to address it. Um, the question is, by these definitions, is structural racial injustice the combination of institutional racism? Yes. When we, when we talk about institutional racism, the way that we were using it, and again, that's a very good question because we throw these terms around. So the, one of the organizations that NEA works with is called Race Forward. When Race Forward talks about institutional racism, what they're talking about is an institution. 
and education as an institution, housing as an institution, financing or as an institution, justice as an institution. Those are set institutions. But when they talk about structural racism, structural racism means that we're talking about the institution and all the – we're talking about a multiple of institutions. So when we're talking about structural racism, we're talking about, like, education and justice and housing and um, all these other things. So when they talk about structural, think of structure as being the big, the big overarching. But inside there, there are the, in, the various institutions. So does that help to answer and clarify that? If not, I please put that back box and I'll go at it again. Thank you, Adrian. Another question that came up, which is a very strong one as well, is how do we call out implicit bias without making the person who we are calling out feel attacked? What would you recommend in they, what they do? Implicit bias, first of all, number one, people don't know they have implicit bias. So right. you can tell me, you can say, Adrian, you have implicit bias. Implicit bias means it's a bias I have that I don't know I have. So it's, that, that is very, very difficult to get to. External biases, overt biases, you know, that's easy. But an implicit bias, I don't know I have it. So the best way to get to an implicit bias is that there needs to be there needs to be uh, small workshops. There needs to be discussions about um, about pick a topic. It doesn't matter what topic it is. It could be how we put up these metal detectors in schools or the school discipline policies, and start talking about who's being impacted more negatively by this particular policy. And start is like peeling the onion. Keep peeling the back. Keep peeling the back, because implicit bias is a process. Not something where you walk in and say, hey, Adrian, you have implicit bias. It's a mm -hmm. process. I have to come to a realization. I have that because I don't know I have that. And I, there has to be a process that you help me to see that I have a bias that impacts a group of students or impacts people negatively. Right, which would go along, too, not just only with our students and our peers and our friends, but another question, even with our colleagues. Somebody mentioned, how do we call out? in using that term for lack of better terms, um, how do we address that with teachers who are biased? You could be my colleague, Adrian. How would you recommend that I would go to you to have that conversation as a colleague? There's, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. First of all, uh, it could be on a one-to-one -one that say that, you know, I'm hearing, you know, I see how you interact with some of the students. Some of the students feel very, um, they feel, I won't use the word disempowered, but they feel that you mm -hmm. don't like them because the way you seem to ignore them. You don't seem to address them. Are, are you aware that, you know, that some of the students just don't feel comfortable in your classroom? I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing from some students they don't feel comfortable in your classroom. More often than not, the, the teacher or the person or the, the, uh, person, the educator you're dealing with, more often than not, they're going to go into a defensive mode. But then right. it would be incumbent upon that person to say, I just want to have a discussion, and perhaps um, we can talk about why some of these students are feeling this way, or why some of these educators are feeling this way, why some of these parents are feeling this way, and start to look at, and I would highly recommend uh, that there be workshops whereby groups of people come together, because this type of topic sometimes can be safer than on the one-on-one, -on -one, a one-on-one, -on -one because it really, you really have to understand, and you really have to know that person well because there's a tendency for people to push back and push back hard because the moment you talk about them being having this bias, most people don't want to be seen as having bias or being seen as being racist. But as I said before, they don't know how this is being perceived and how this is being received by others. This is a place where I would recommend workshops, that there would be a workshop like 101 on biases and then opportunities for people to go off and engage in small group discussions or one or two activities about bias. It could be looking at a video. It could be talking about something in their school system, something in their school, and then talk about how they feel about that. How does that impact different groups of people? And why did that come about? And then start to tease through that because it's not as easy as going in to say, hey, this is happening. Great point. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question that comes up, um, and I just, I'm just i going to identify the first one. It would also be help to frame it in a positive manner. How can we blank feel more comfortable? That's very good. That's a great comment in regards to how we can address that. 
Um, if there are more questions, we will address them. Um, if you email them, to, um, that was a powerful webinar, Dr. Dorrington. Thank you but so I, much. I do want to share one other thing with you that one of my teachers shared last night when we were actually talking. She's an African-American teacher. She's now been in the system now for 14 years, but she talked about her early career. And uh, she's raised in a large family, and she has brothers, African-American brothers. But she didn't realize about a bias that she had until years later. She was offered a job to teach in an all-boys school, and this uh, school was primarily African-Americans. She said herself last night on the webinar, I was afraid to teach African-American boys. I was afraid of them. Because she said, I remember what my brothers did. So I was fearful. She said, I knew what they did when I was a kid. But she said, I didn't realize that I was afraid. I was afraid of them until after I got into the classroom. Then she said, then I started to realize how I was acting. So she said, once she realized how she was acting, she started to reflect upon, like, why am I doing that? Like, why am I feeling that way? Now, she was able to deconstruct. She was able to analyze her own behavior. But again, she shared last night, she was a black woman that had an implicit bias for black males. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that sometimes just because you know, we think that blacks can't be discriminatory or whites can't be discriminatory within their own race or within their own culture and so on. That's not the case. That's not Very the case. True. These are biases. Very true. Thank you, Dr. Dorrington. I would like to thank Adrian. Also, Dr. Dorrington, as we call her, for a fantastic and very informative webinar. And on behalf of the entire NEA ESP Quality Department and NEA's Teacher Quality Department, I would like to thank you all, as Dr. Dorrington said, for taking out your time this evening to participate in this webinar.